speaker. Um, just short introduction, most of you already know, I've said it a couple times, but I'm Meg Williamson. I am a current senior at Christendom College where I'm majoring in history. Uh, I grew up in an actively conservative family, but it wasn't until I went to college that I really made it my own passion to educate others on conservative values and um, fight for conservative issues. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you to the Claire Booth Luce Center and all organizations like that who encourage and provide opportunities for young women like myself to um, fight for principles they believe in. And with that being said, I am very excited and honored to introduce our next speaker, Lisa Deftari. Uh, Lisa is an award-winning investigative journalist focusing on foreign affairs with expertise in the Middle East and counterterrorism. She regularly appears on television and radio with commentary and analysis, providing exclusive reporting on vital developments in the region. She frequently appears as an on-air political analyst and has previously been featured on Fox News, CBS, NBC, PBS, NPR, ABC, Voice of America, SiriusXM, The Washington Post, and others. Lisa has been interviewed in Spanish, English, and Persian. In over a decade of coverage in the region, Lisa's areas of expertise include the Middle East and North Africa, terrorism, national security, cybersecurity, anti-Semitism, global Christian persecution, human rights, and more. She is frequently called upon to give briefings, expert testimony to government and private entities, and has worked for a number of think tanks in Washington, where she has written exclusive reports for the Pentagon and other government groups. In 2006, Lisa was invited to show her documentary film about an Iranian underground political movement in Congress, calling for global attention on human rights abuses and regime change in Iran. Lisa holds a master's degree in broadcast journalism for the University of Southern California, Annenberg School of Journalism, and completed her undergraduate degree in Middle East Studies, Spanish, and Vocal Performance at Rutgers University. After graduate school, Lisa received a Carnegie Knight Fellowship focusing her research on a post-9-11 America. The Washington Times named Lisa one of the 30 hottest women in politics, and last year she did a TED Talk on fake news. She is fluent in Farsi and Spanish and is an avid opera singer and pianist. Lisa grew up in a suburb of New York City and currently travels back and forth between NYC and LA. She is the editor-in-chief of The Foreign Desk and the host of The Foreign Desk with Lisa Deftari. And today, Lisa will be t talking on foreign policy in Iran. So please um, welcome Lisa Daftari to the stage. Thank you so much. I actually will be using this mic so I'm not tethered to a podium. And um, thank you very much for having me today. Our last speaker left off with the sentiment of being on the wrong side of history. And since I will be talking about Biden's foreign policy, I think that's a great place to segue and start. Um, yes, so there's so much to unpack. I literally cannot think of a, a day on the calendar so far where we would have such an important talk about Biden's foreign policy and how it has led us into the current war um, of Hamas in, against Israel in the Middle East. And what we're watching is, as of this morning, a ground operation by, by Israel's IDF into Gaza. And I will start uh, many years before that, and I will end up talking about the war and leave plenty of time for your Q&A. So generally, what has kept the United States being the United States, being superior and being the leader and being all the things that when I was younger were wonderful things, just like it would be wonderful to win a trophy, not give it to the transgender, give it to somebody else. When, when, when I was younger, foreign policy uh, was that the United States would keep a consistent foreign policy. And if you take President Obama and President Biden out, out of the presidential timeline in, in, in more modern uh, US history, you would have a very stable, consistent foreign policy. And what do I mean by that? Our allies, like Israel, could rely on us. They would know where we stood. Our enemies, China, Russia, Iran's regime, would also know where we stand. But now that's not the case, right? So I'm gonna start with President Obama coming into office and that was very interesting. It was the first time you had a president who wasn't proud of the country he wanted to represent. So imagine I go and apply for a job at, um, 
I don't know. Target. I want to be the CEO of Target, but I actually hate Target. I want to go around to all the, I want to go to Walmart and say, I'm sorry. I want to go to CVS and Walgreens and say, I'm sorry. I suck. I'm the worst. And that's exactly what we saw by President Obama. He went over to Middle Eastern countries that were very important to us and said, I'm so sorry. And he took us from the pedestal that we were on and he actually was on his knees saying, I'm sorry. Very different positioning for the United States. And that had consequences. Even though the mainstream media will tell you that didn't have consequences, it had tremendous consequences. So fast forward to, um, well, you don't need to fast forward that fast, but we'll start with uh, President Obama's view on the Middle East, because that's what I really want to focus on. I could really give this talk for four hours, so we're going to try to be 40 minutes, <laughs> or at least 25, and then I'll leave time for questions. Um, with regards to the Middle East, he turned the Middle East on its head. Why? Because our ally Israel all of a sudden found itself in a position where mm, things were awkward. And people then tried to pass it off as a personal, uh, personal beef between Bibi Netanyahu, a very tough, hawkish figure, and Obama. Right? It, they, they didn't get along. That's bogus. We don't base an entire foreign policy on our ally and their, our friendship and the, the, the interest allied, uh, uh, allied um, relationship that we had on a relationship between two men. Right? So Israel found itself very much not knowing whether or not the United States had its back. Why? Because President Obama was very interested in turning this axis in the Middle East towards Iran's regime. He favored Iran's regime. And because of that, we, again, alienated many of our allies. And to go very quickly, we, we got to the 2009 Green Revolution in Iran. It was the first time in, at that point, let's say it was 30, 30 years, 35 years, that Iran's regime found itself in another uh, round of protests, but this time, what started as protests that were uh, protesting a fraudulent election against the president of Iran turned into, we want this regime gone. And that became the Green Revolution. Many people call it the Twitter Revolution. It was the first time social media was used in a movement to tell the world Iran's regime, that Iran's people want their regime gone. But at that time, Michael Jackson died the news about Iran stopped, and more than anything else, President Obama did not lend a hand to the Iranian people to support their movement. He favored, again, Iran's regime. He, what was he working towards at that time? He was working towards an Iran nuclear deal. In 2015, we, we gave billions of dollars to Iran, Iran's regime. We loosened sanctions. We gave them all the concessions. I'm really glossing over this just to get to where we are today. Uh, we, we loosened sanctions. We gave them billions of dollars. Remember the pellets of cash that people refer to today because it will be re relevant again today. Uh, and we signed a, a meaningless piece of paper with Iran's regime to say they're not going to have a nuclear weapon and we're all good now. We can all sleep safely at, at night knowing that uh, Iran is not going to have a nuclear weapon. Well, that wasn't the case, right? Iran was working on enriching uranium. The centrifuges were spinning. The cameras from the IAEA, which is the UN nuclear watchdog, were being shut off. And Iran was being, of course, duplicitous in every way and continuing with its human rights abuses. Trump comes on into office. Now, Trump, from the time he campaigned, even before he even wanted to become president, he always said this this deal is bogus. This deal is dangerous. If I come into office, the first thing I'm going to do is rip up this deal. And that's exactly what he did. In May of 2018, he pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. And he did a lot of other things that were very, very, very consequential in the Middle East. Right? He, as opposed to Obama, wanted to turn the United States' um, foreign policy in the Middle East back to what it was more traditionally. Now, this at that time seemed radical. Why? Because we hadn't been openly so friendly to Israel. So many presidents talked about moving the embassy, for example. Trump actually did it. He was uh, very, very friendly with Bibi Netanyahu, but more than anything, he wanted the U.S. to be openly friendly with Israel. He doubled down on the Golan Heights. They moved the embassy. Uh, with Iran's regime, he pulled out of this, the, the, the uh, nuclear deal. So things were on a different path for the Middle East. Okay? Then Biden comes into office. So for three years, we have Biden being extremely um, 
the buy, I should say, he came into office wanting to get back into a deal. So for three years, what did he do? He spent his time whining and dining the Iran regime, going back to the nuclear negotiating table. And what did they do? Each time they asked for more. They asked for more. They asked for more. So much so that Antony Blinken, Secretary of State, Joe Biden, uh, have you guys heard of Robert Malley? Okay, special envoy. He was given this job just to become the liaison or just to become the person who deals with Iran's regime to get a deal. And again, they wanted it so badly, but imagine what Iran's regime wanted that they couldn't push this deal through. But we were saved by the clock. Their time ran out, and the people of Iran came back onto the streets. The people of Iran came back onto the streets, and for the last year, have you guys heard of the Masa Amini protests? So Masa Amini, a 22-year-old girl, comes out into the streets of Tehran visiting her family. She's actually of Kurdish, that's her ethnic descent. She comes from a different province, comes to Tehran to visit her family. And her hijab, like many modern Iranian women, was further back on her head, very lax, very loose. And she gets taken in by Iran's morality police. She's beaten so badly, she slips into a coma and loses her life after 48 hours. This became the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Iranians rush to the streets and all over the world, those who support them, the expatriate communities in New York and LA and elsewhere throughout Europe and Canada come out onto the streets to tell the world the Iranian people are united in their message. It's not about reform, it's not about any policies. They could literally let us walk around naked tomorrow and it won't make a difference. We want this regime gone. We don't want any concessions, we just want them gone. And the Biden administration first said, we don't involve ourselves with regime change, and we don't talk about these things. We're going to wait and see what happens. And what happened? The, their, their movement basically fizzled out because they did not get the support that they wanted from the United States. During the last three years, now, uh, Michelle wanted me to bring in a lot of how Iran gained this, and, and I'm so sorry, I'm going very quickly over this timeline, but I wanted to get to the point of how Iran got to where it is in terms of its influence here over the last few years. Because of the Biden administration's lax position on Iran, they have been able to do one of many things. So if you, I'm going to list them now. A, an investigative report broke last week. It was by Iran International and another reporter, Jay Solomon, that showed that Iran, for the last three years or more, it started out, I should say, under Obama, but more actively in the last three years, started a group of experts that right now, this is very scary, actually one of them works for the Pentagon, many of them appear on CNN and MSNBC, and they are actually reporting back to Iran's foreign minister. So there are actual emails from a woman Okay, her name is Aryan Tabatabai. She actually works for the Pentagon, but there are emails in which she asks Iran's foreign minister, how can I be of better help to you? How can I help you? We have someone who is reporting to Iran's regime and working inside the Pentagon, right? So many questions. How does someone like this get security clearance, right? How does someone like this slip through the cracks? The Pentagon's initial reaction to all of this was, well, we're, we're okay with it, we, we like her, <laughs> she's fine. And then the next day, obviously, as this story started to gain momentum in the media, they went back and said that we're gonna look into it. We have yet to find out what happened and, and whether or not they're gonna look into it. We also have um, Iran's regime, because of the loosening of very vital sanctions, uh, made 60 to $80 billion in oil sales just this year, right? And at the last um, episode that many of you might be aware of is we just had a prisoner swap with Iran's regime that was extremely lopsided. What do I mean by that? It was five for five, but their five were actual criminals <laughs> or terrorists, and our five were probably there to visit family or take care of their real estate properties and were, were thrown into prison and became pawns in this awful game. And now we're, we're exchanging prisoners, but we also allowed, the Biden administration allowed, Iran to unfreeze $6 billion. So we gave them a little cherry on top, a little bonus, they have $6 billion. Let's put that all aside. Last Saturday morning, very early in the morning, 
war started in Israel. How many of you are following this war? Okay. So um, it was Friday night in Los Angeles, so I was able to follow it from the initial hours. I saw some rockets going in. I looked at the map. There was a lot of red dots because this happens often, right? So the, the actual existence of people who live in Israel is that they often have to go down to their bomb shelters. The Iron Dome comes up, and obviously they can live safely because of all this technology, because of how premier they are in counterterrorism measures, but for some reason, they had no idea about this surprise attack by Hamas. Multi-pronged, multifaceted. They came in on air, sea, land. They invaded in many different parts of the south, southern border. They got in about 1,000 to 1,500 militants, got into the country by foot, and they just started a bloodbath. This is traditional warfare, but by the ISIS brand. Beheadings. Babies were killed. There's bullet holes in toddlers. And they took about, at least we believe, somewhere between 100 and 200 hostages back with them to Gaza. That's where we believe they are. Horrific. Horrific. I mean, I, um, I was telling a few people I actually had to go to the ER two or three days ago just because I fainted. Not knowing, I do this, I do this work all the time. I've covered so, so much of this. I've covered ISIS and, and, and Boko Haram and everything, but just, I guess, watching this footage for so many days on end of all the babies and all the, the kids, I mean, the children. You just watch these poor children. This is not, this is cowardly warfare. This is barbaric warfare where they were targeting civilians. And now I want to just talk for a few minutes because this is what's missed by the mainstream media because they want to make it about both sides. And I, I had some students ask me about this before, like, I, I think you're pro-Israel. Tell me about that. It's not pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian right now. It's pro-life. It's pro-human. It's, it's barbaric. And um, it's unfortunate because the mainstream media does take its time with all of this and then will present it as it's being both sides. But right now, it would be as though, and I gave someone this example, imagine in the hours after 9-11, the days after 9-11, someone would say, well, I understand Al-Qaeda's position too. I mean, or watching ISIS in 2014 and saying, I mean, they had it coming. The beheadings, I mean, come on. They had it coming. Those Kurdish women, they had those rapes coming to them. They, they had it coming to them. No one would speak that way. Um, but unfortunately, there is a, 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 a problem with the narrative when it comes to Israel, and that definitely has to do with the foreign policy of the Biden administration and what it's created in the last three years. Definitely has to do with all the social justice movements and the cross-sectionality where they have brainwashed young people in America to believe if you're gay, you have to hate Israel. If you're black, you have to hate Israel. If you are anything on the margins, part of your checklist is to hate Israel. And that's why we're seeing different opinions. I, you know, that's what's most exhausting about this job, right? So I'm a journalist, I'm also a political commentator, so I go on and I, prevent, I, I provide context for a lot of these things. And you know, when you see someone in Gaza who's been brainwashed against Israel, you can understand a bit more. But when you see someone at Harvard taking sides with Hamas, who is on, the, on, on, on our US terror list, that's very problematic. And that is, again, a consequence of how we got to where we are. And just to go back to tying this all together, you know, people talk about whether or not, you know, who's responsible for this? How do we even deal with this? How do we go forward? Well, the Biden administration has actually been very good at the podium. I was telling someone, I, I have a lot of sources inside Israel who are very pro bb and pro-Donald Trump. That means they're on the right in Israel and they're on the right in the United States. But right now, they look at Joe Biden as a messiah because of the support that they, that they got from him, podium talk. They, they couldn't be happier. A, they're desperate, and B, they, they didn't expect, they didn't expect with the positioning that Biden had, didn't invite Bibi to the White House, didn't congratulate him on his election, and called out Bibi on the domestic policies, which again, are none of our business. It's none of our business what, what, what Israel does inside the country, and, and it's not Biden's position or Kamala Harris's position to criticize Israel's domestic policies, which they did. So it brings us back to who financed this war, how did we get here, and what's the, the US's involvement in all this. Um, 
initially Michelle just wanted me to talk about Iran and the, foreign, the Biden foreign policy with regards to Iran, but it's impossible to really leave out this war right now because of Iran's involvement in it. Um, how many of you have heard these talking points about the $6 billion and that it didn't get to them yet, right? The check is still right. So as I said in a Fox interview this week, let's, take, let's say, for example, that check is sitting in my bedroom. I have it. They don't have it. I have it. Who is truly to believe that either A, Hamas still doesn't have the billions of dollars that Iran gave to them from the Obama days, or B, it's the Palestinian aid that was reinstated by the Biden administration hours after they came into office, or C, from the billions of dollars, 60 to 80 billion in oil sales in which the Biden administration loosened sanctions on Iran's regime that freed up money, or D, just the talk just the smell of $6 billion coming into their account gives them confidence. If you know, if you have a checking and a savings account and you know that $6 billion is coming into your savings account, you're going to be pretty generous about your checking, right? So in the last week, exhausting as this is, it's more infuriating to watch the Biden administration very unfortunately try to sanitize the narrative and remove themselves and their responsibility for this, right? So we have... Um, the B Biden administration, both Antony Blinken traveled to Israel and Biden going to the podium many times at the White House to, to convey support for Israelis, giving the IDF basically a green light to do whatever they want, providing them with ad additional resources to carry out their military um, efforts in Gaza. But at the same time, they have already removed any mention of Iran in the, in the narrative. And that is really just taking away U.S. responsibility and, and, and how dangerous our foreign policy has been with regards to Iran and how they finance this entire war. Another thing I want to mention is the Wall Street Journal came out with an expose a few nights ago when people were still debating this $6 billion and it wasn't Iran because they didn't get that check yet. The Wall Street Journal came out with an actual timeline of how four different terror organizations, all of them, financed by Iran's regime, met in Beirut over the last couple of months, although they, we do believe, based on Israel's intelligence, that this was planned for much longer than a few months. The few months is when it was pretty much wrapped up. They were able to discuss how it would happen, when it would happen, giving them the finances, perhaps allegedly giving them some training as well to carry out such an attack. And that's, that's what brings us to, um, to today. Um, well, how are we on time? Okay. Um, I want to talk about some of the, the consequences to all of this. I know a lot of people um, don't, they just don't know enough about it contextually, right? So we can go back to biblical times and to how Israel um, got to where it is today. We can talk about Israel from 1948. We can talk about, um, you know, the last few years. But really, I, I want to just leave you with a few different important points that the media is missing on all of this. Um, number one, namely that um, people talk about victims on both sides. Absolutely. There are victims on both sides. Um, you will see a lot of footage in coming days of Palestinian children, and that absolutely is true. Um, few, few differences here. The attack last Saturday morning by Hamas targeted civilians. They came to take out families. They wanted there to be shock value. They wanted to behead babies. And when people tell you, well, I, I actually had an interview yesterday, um, and they said, well, there are things that led up to this. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. We can talk about policies and we can talk about things on the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, but there will never be anything political or policy related that will lead someone to behead 40 babies. That's just, that's not the way to set up the question and that's not any, that's not any premise that would ever be accepted. Um, I also want to talk about today. Today, my son is not in school. Many children are not in school because Hamas announced a day of rage where they ask people around the world to attack the non-believers. Not just Jews, guys, not just Jews. Going after Christians, going after atheists, going after anyone who does not fold under the Hamas flag. 
There has, has already been a stabbing in France. I know if you guys have, are on social media, hopefully you're not because this is exhausting. This is very tough to digest, but also important to stay informed. Uh, there have been very, very violent protests on the streets of France because France came out and said, we're not going to have any pro-Hamas protests here. Uh, there have been very, very violent protests between Hamas uh, supporters and the police who were clashing all night, and it led up to a, a jihadi stabbing a school teacher this morning and shouting, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. So when you see things like this, it's very difficult to say it's because of land, or it's because of a two-state solution, or it's because of anything more than an ideology that is rooted in hate and killing the non-believer. Um, oh, did someone raise their hand? Okay, just a few more points and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so much to, to, to cover here, but I really, I wanted to take you based on, you know, from Obama's foreign policy through Biden's foreign policy and show how the flip-flopping of foreign policies between by, uh, uh, Obama, then Trump, then Biden brings us to where we are today and how this, this war is not just Israel's war. Israel is fighting this war, but they're fighting it on behalf of all freedom-loving people throughout the world. They're fighting it on behalf of the United States that has its fingerprints all over this, unfortunately. And when Biden or Blinken take to the podium and they show their support for Israel, my question, and I wish I could be there and be in the room, would be, but how are you going to change your Iran policy going forward? And will you change your Iran policy going forward? Because that is exactly the reason we are where we are today. They are, have infiltrated media. They have infiltrated our colleges. They have infiltrated our labs. Just like China, really, but we've given access to all of our enemies, and they're here. I'm Iranian myself, and I uh, obviously follow a lot of the news in, in Persian language. And it's, it's crazy to see how Iran's regime and many members of it are, are not only celebrating this attack of Hamas against Israel, they're really taking a lot of credit for it. They're very happy that this happened. Then you watch Hamas, where a lot of the leaders of Hamas are coming up with videos or saying, Thank you to Iran's regime for all the support. Thank you for the money. Thank you for the training. But then you have the White House saying, we don't, we don't really think Iran was involved. We still, we're not really convinced Iran was involved. So a lot, I mean, there's a lot to unpack. It's <laughs> very difficult to do it in 20 minutes. But just wanted to give you a synopsis of what's happening. And if I can leave you with one sentiment, it would be to ask the questions. Don't fall for the narratives that are being uh, pushed by the mainstream media and uh, ask a lot of questions because this will affect us all. And I know someone will ask about the southern border and if this is going to happen here, and I'll probably leave that for Q&A. <laughs> so thank you so much. Hi, my name's Lauren. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion on whether we should be involved in this war, like deploying our troops into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Is this our duty, and should our men be out there fighting if Biden supposedly or maybe helped Iran start, start this war? Yeah, great question. Really a great question. I mean, we never want to get involved in any war, and now look how many wars we're involved in, right? Um, and it always begs the question, I mean, how does Biden or anyone else who's in office decide to what extent we get involved? I mean, how does he decide how many billions are going to go to Ukraine next? Th right? The checks keep going out. Um, and how do we decide whether we would get involved if China should invade Taiwan, which they probably will before he's out of office, uh, and whether or not we have enough to give them and what we would give them, et cetera. Um, I actually have been following this very closely, and, and I don't want to say that, that the United States should get involved, obviously, for many reasons. But I do think that if Hezbollah in Lebanon gets involved in a significant way, it would, we would have to get involved to at least you know, kind of control the momentum with which this war is going forward. Otherwise, I'm not saying Israel doesn't have a chance. I'm saying it would be very difficult if Israel is surrounded I think symbolically, the United States would have to get involved to say, hey, 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 you don't mess with our ally. And that sentiment is, is lost, right? I was saying to someone before we started, in a way, obviously nobody wants this war, in a way the IDF is well positioned, even though the surprise attack happened and it's on them and, and, and there obviously will be a lot of 
of, uh, of Intel coming out to come. The IDF is in a, in a good position because world opinion have about Israel has never been so low, right? So what are they afraid of? Are they going to get written up at the UN? They already do. Is MSNBC, CNN, and, and BBC going to butcher them in their, in their headlines? They already do. I mean, in, in the world of, uh, in, the, in, in the court of world opinion or whatever they say, um, Israel is already so, so hated because of the, 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 really the message coming out of the White House and the media that at this point they do have that, that kind of advantage to doing what they need to do for their own security and safety. Whereas I think a lot of times they would have to be very, very careful about the Palestinian death toll. They would have to be very careful about a land invasion of, of Gaza. Last night, the news broke that the Israelis told the, told the Gazans through Hamas and the UN, evacuate, get the heck out of there, we're coming in. And the, the Hamas turned around and said, this is, this is a pure propaganda, stay put. Those, those people are going to become numbers and they're going to become casualties and then then that's when you're going to hear BBC, and that's when you're going to see the New York Times covers, and that's when you're going to see the LA Times covers, but you'd probably see them anyway. So I don't think Israel is as worried right now about that global opinion. They might have been on their best behavior. I'll add this little angle, because it seems like you guys are into foreign policy. Um, Israel may have been on its best behavior for maybe a few months at least because of this deal with Saudi Arabia that was coming up. That was a, a big deal for them. As you guys know, I wanted to mention, and I didn't get a chance to, the Abraham Accords that were signed under uh, President Trump was probably the most significant, significant policy towards Middle East that we've seen in decades. It ch really changed the, the trajectory of the Middle East. And I do hope, this is my silver lining of all this, that once the dust settles, that Saudi Arabia is smart enough to say, this attack by Hamas is the reason we need to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia. This is exactly what we don't want in our own country. And Saudi Arabia is smart enough to know that and want that. And if you recall, just a few weeks ago, in the same day, Saudi Arabia sent a minister over to the Palestinians and said, yeah, we love you, we, want, we support a, a two-state solution. And the same day, the first minister from Israel, happened to be a tourism minister, went over to Saudi Arabia for their first visit. So Saudi Arabia was kind of being like, we can't betray our cousins, we got to keep them happy, but our future is with Israel and the moderate Arab states and the Abraham Accords and that sentiment. So that's the vibe of the modern Middle East going forward. What we have to do is root out extremism, root out Hamas, make the world understand that if you care about the Palestinians, they're victims of Hamas. And so is everyone else living under any one of the proxy groups that are supported by Iran's regime. Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, insurgencies in Iraq, insurgencies in Syria, and the list goes on and on. Okay, thank you. Good question. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. My name is Evangeline. I actually work at the Claire Booth Luce Center. And I recently saw that um, a report that um, Hamas had used weapons that were left behind in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about how the really poor execution of the Afghanistan pullout um, may have affected this entire thing and our involvement, and uh, if perhaps Biden were not president, if that would have gone better, right. never mind. <laughs> Uh, honestly, that this is a, a quick one. It's a great question. Also, obviously all related. Look, our, our pullout of Afghanistan was such a, can I say shit show here? Okay. Um, it was that, and it was bad, that it, it, look, it all matters, right? Our enemies are looking and being like, like they're not, they're not, they're not here. They're not in office. They're not home. They're not, you know, they're not around. So do what you need to do. And when you have the Taliban stepping up and being like, we want to help Hamas, you want the White House to still lie to us and say this is Taliban 2.0, they're different? They're not any different. They don't even let women leave home. I mean, again, who said it before? Where, where's the Me Too movement? Where are the women's groups? Where's the women's march? Where are they? They didn't step up for Iran's women. They didn't step up in the squad. All, I mean, we have to call out these people that are lying to us, that they're here to speak out on behalf of freedom-seeking women around the world. They are not. Right? The, this is, again, be pro-Palestinian, be pro-this, be pro-that. This is really the battle between good and evil. This is a moral war more than anything else. Don't let anyone lie to you and say it's because of a blockade or a two-state solution or because of water or gas or anything else. It's pure evil and it has to be called out and it has to start with us. We have to call it out.
Thank you. Of course. Also, with, uh, with regards to that, I want to take the next question. But this morning, I saw um, footage from one of my intel sources that had the United Nations. So, you know, we give money to, well, the United Nations gives money to UNRWA, which is one of the groups that helps out with the Palestinians, but they also get direct aid um, to the Palestinian authorities from, from the Biden administration that reinstated after Trump took it away. I mentioned that. They were using, Hamas was using that aid. So a lot of the weapons, one of the, um, I think the medic bags had the UN logo on it. So again, our taxpayer money is Hamas, jihadis, using it against civilians. How do we keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon without giving them a carrot? Good question. So I always preface this with, this is assuming they don't already have it. Why wouldn't they? But I don't want to be conspiratorial. Maybe they have it, maybe they don't, but they're very close to getting it. So how do we, at this point, right, how do we control Iran's regime from doing any more damage from what it has already done? Look, Iran's regime had already been working towards a nuclear weapon, obviously. In the last three years, they had every reason to do so. And in the last year, when they actually, the biggest threat to Iran's regime will always be its people. That's how they came into office, Iranians flooding the streets in 79. And that's how they, they believe would be the only way that they would have to leave office is not because of any president in the United States, but more so because of a grassroots movement that would gain so much momentum that it would pressure them out. So in the last year, that's when they have been the most scared for their, for their longevity, for, for remaining uh, at, 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 the, at the helm and controlling the Middle East. So they have definitely fortified, whether it's their weapons program, whether it's their proxies doing their dirty work in the region, as we're seeing in this war of Hamas in, in Israel. And really, the best way, and I'll arrive to your question now, best way is to really echo the sentiments of the people of Iran and, and support their, their movement. Let them do it, but support regime change. It's the only way. Look, so many of our global ailments will be, will be remedied by getting them out. It's really a no-brainer, but unfortunately, with President Obama, President Biden, they've empowered them. They've absolutely empowered them, and they've set back They've set back the Green Revolution. They've set back uh, this Masa Amini movement. They've set back the People's Movement. Recently, I don't know if any of you saw this, but President Obama was in a podcast a few months after the Masa Amini protest started, and he actually admitted, surprise, surprise, that it was a huge mistake on his part not to support the Green Revolution of 2009. Too little, too late, but it's interesting to see that it was a huge mistake, and it's, it's being admitted. Thank you. Hey, um, if America was to get more involved in the war in Israel, do you think it could hinder the election in 2024? Hinder in what way? Um, keep Biden in office. Keep him in office? Interesting. Um, you know, it depends. I don't know where, how, where this narrative is going to go. I, I truly, I, it's a great question. Um, I don't think any war will keep any president in office unless it is, you know, wrapped around so quickly. Remember in the days of 9-11, Bush won his, his re-election based on his very swift action. I think there's so much more to it right now. I think a lot of people in the United States are very disillusioned um, by, you know, I don't, I, I don't think anybody sees Biden as competent even if he is going to uh, step in in the, in, in the Middle East. And I think that obviously a lot of his own personal issues with his son, a lot of the corruption, the fact that he can't formulate a sentence is probably the most um, <laughs> compelling talking point against, you know. But um, I think we're going to see a lot of twists and turns before the election. But the one thing that upsets me about the American people is that foreign policy usually is never an issue unless, God forbid, God forbid, there is an attack on our homeland before the election. I don't see this war being as much of an issue as the economy. People in LA are paying $8 a gallon for gas right now. And I get it, I get it. You gotta put food on the table, you gotta worry. I mean, fentanyl is a big issue, the border is a big issue. That, that affects families and it also is a, a national security issue. So I think um, in, that's kind of like a, and again, it depends on who we get on the Republican side. I think the Republicans are their own biggest enemies right now. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, it's unfortunate, but I think that they need to play this out properly and really um, hit the right notes and uh, really underscore 
the biggest, a lot of these blunders that the White House has done. Again, if you guys um, are into foreign policy, I do a daily top 10 email for free. It comes out every weekday. Um, I can subscribe whoever would like to be subscribed, or you can go to my uh, website, foreigndesknews.com, and you can sign up. This morning, we had a ton of these stories, one of them being um, the White House's, um, you know, kind of efforts to take out Iran from the narrative and actually, uh, they literally scrubbed it from uh, the write-ups about this war. It's very problematic. Again, Iranians admitting it, Hamas admitting it, but the White House taking a step back from the narrative because of our own involvement in, in empowering Iran's regime. Thank you. I listened to uh, Dan Bongino. Um, and he's a podcaster. And I agree with what he's saying. I would like your opinion. He said this was not an intelligence failure. This was an intelligence leak. And frankly, Biden's blood, this country is involved in that. And we are already involved in that. They are crossing the border. I'm from Arizona now. They're crossing the border. I don't know who's coming into my state. So do you believe it's an intelligence leak as opposed to a failure? I will tell you this. So there were reports by the, the White House yesterday, and the, uh, sorry, the day before. I don't even know what day of the week it is. It's been the longest week of my life. Um, that, that Egypt was trying to tip off, right, BS, right? So Bibi Netanyahu was like dead on arrival. He didn't want to even hear that BS. So, I'll be honest with you. I have a, a lot of sources within the Shin Bet, which is the the top notch, the top echelon of Israel's uh, counterterrorism uh, community um, for years. And you know, anything happens, they they have my WhatsApp. They they're messaging me right away. Um, I've been speaking with them nonstop. Um, Nothing that I have heard so far as to why there was this intelligence blunder sits well with me. Nothing. So to Dan Bongino's point, I don't know what happened, but I know that this could not have been. We're talking about, so if you guys follow Israel, Israel foils the most minuscule plots in Cyprus against two Israeli tourists, okay? They have called out plots for the United States that have saved us multiple casualties, right? They have found plots in Greece recently. I mean, they are premier. Why? Because they have to. Their existence is on the line. They have to. So you can't say they were lazy. It was a weekend. It was the Sabbath. It was the end of Sukkot, a major holiday. No, I don't buy it. It was a weekend. The soldiers were home. Someone else said to me, Recently, obviously, there has been domestic issues in Israel left against right. So a lot of the military class and military families' reserves are lefty, woke, let's say. Take that with a grain of salt in Israel. And they are against Bibi, so they're very lax. No. Israel is not going to put its guns down because of, again, domestic issues. You can't afford to be woke in the sense of let them kill us, let them kill our children. The one thing that will always unite Israelis and which has kept Bibi Netanyahu's political career alive is how tremendous he is with national security and counterterrorism. So none of what I'm hearing makes any sense for me and sits well with me, which is why I keep asking the questions. I actually put, and this is again my uh, speculation perhaps, but I thought maybe they heard some rumors, but they were a little bit more reserved about it because of the upcoming um, deal with Saudi Arabia. Perhaps they had to be on their best behavior and they didn't want to jump the gun and they may have underestimated what Hamas would do if they came in. But again, I don't think Israel underestimates. I just don't. I just, I don't, it just doesn't sit well with me. So, you know, I, and I also, I find it very damaging to uh, criticize, you know, BB right now only because I think there's more to the story. I think he should take responsibility to a certain extent, but I don't think, like, for example, Donald Trump yesterday said, Bibi should resign, it's all his fault. I think right now we should just be condemning Hamas, We're uniting against jihadism all around the world, especially as they're calling for a day of rage to come after people like us, right? So, you know, I couldn't take the train here today because there were rumors that they're going to hit public transportation. There's actually a legitimate threat against New York City subways today. 
That doesn't have to do with land. It has nothing to do with Gaza or the West Bank or Israel or Jerusalem or the Al-Aqsa Mosque or anything like that, right? This is pure evil. It's targeted against the free world and anybody who's freedom-seeking and freedom-loving, and that includes all of us. So I think the sooner we come to that and we kind of sh try to push the world opinion and narrative towards that, the sooner we can get rid of this. And we, we keep saying get rid of it, but it keeps rearing its ugly head time and time again. So this is very reminiscent for me of when ISIS was in, you know, doing its world tour in uh, 2014. But you know, in terms of numbers, this is a much larger scale. I know you guys are seeing a lot of those social media posts that say, if you take the ratio, this would be like a 9-11 in the United States where 25,000 people would be killed because of the ratio of number of people of, in, in Israel and obviously being a country the state of the size of New Jersey with enemies surrounding it on all sides. Wrap up the last yeah. quick question. Sure. Are you open to uh, going and speaking on campuses of these girls if they're interested in having you? I would love proper to. Proper security. I absolutely, yeah, we need very proper security because there's a price on my head. I, in 2014, I wrote a piece for Fox News where, if you, you guys probably don't recall, but it was Operation Protective Edge, which was one of these, you know, Hamas's attacks on Israel. And I wrote a piece that said, a lot of war-weary Gazans are mad at Hamas more so than they're mad at Israel, and I got put on the Hamas hit list, so um, it's, it's fine. It comes with the territory, <laughs> but um, they, they don't like us messing with their propaganda and narratives. So um, to your question, I would love to come on campus, but obviously need proper security. Thank you. Thank you.